Hey everybody, today Supernatural Theology is a little different because I have a conversation with Eric Gilmore of Sonship International. This was one of the richest, most powerful conversations about intimacy with God, about encountering Jesus and living a life immersed in the gospel. You are going to be encouraged. I had tears in my eyes within about the first 60 seconds of our time together, and my eyes were kind of leaking throughout our conversation. So legitimately anointed and powerful. Uh, Stay tuned to the end as well. I want to let you know about some of the ways that you can connect with Eric's ministry. He's written books. He's got an amazing YouTube channel, and uh, he's probably a voice that you're going to want to keep in touch with. Do me a favor. Go ahead and share the video. If you're on Facebook, if you're on Instagram, if you're on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. And for everybody out there, we're beginning now to do daily shorts on the YouTube channel. So you don't want to miss those. So go ahead and go to the Supernatural Theology YouTube channel and subscribe. And uh, man, this is going to be really good. I'll see you on the other side of the conversation. God, thank you for the honor of getting to connect with this man. God, we thank you that your presence is here, that your presence is there with Eric. We just welcome you, Holy Spirit, to have your way. We just pray Jesus would be glorified. We pray, God, that you would draw your people to yourself as we talk together. In Jesus' name. I'm already leaking before we even begin. (laughs) (laughs) Praise God. Yeah. All right. (laughs) Ah, well, Eric Gilmore, so amazing to have you join Supernatural Theology. Thank you so much. It's my honor. (laughs) I'm already loving you. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, you know, um, we had a a church I was pastoring up until about a year ago. We had Michael Koulianos at a conference, and uh, I had been paying attention to his stuff for a little while, and... Sometime after that, I saw a a conference session where you preached, and I thought, man, I am going to just follow whatever this guy releases. I'm just going to eat it up. And I have been since then, about the past two years. I've watched just about every video that you released, and uh, the two things that have really struck me about you, because these are two things that have deeply impacted me, uh, one of them is... You know, Paul had this theme of his life that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. You know, that just the the revelation of Jesus is the power of God. And from the first message I heard you preach, I was like, man, this guy didn't read this in a book. Like, (laughs) this is his life that's being poured out. And then the other thing is that... uh, that reality of 2 Corinthians 3.17, when we behold the glory of God, we are changed into his image. And those two themes of just, you know, seeking the face of God, encountering him, loving him, deep relationship with him, and then the theme of the gospel as our bread and our life. Uh, it's kind of been the theme really of supernatural theology for the past four years, Uh, And you are honestly one of the voices, my wife would say the same thing, that I have received more from the past two years. We actually met once. You you probably, I know you meet a lot of people like I do, but uh, we met, I was in Orlando with uh, Jim and Evelyn Whitley, and I met you in a green room for like five minutes, so a year or two ago. But anyway, uh, thank you so much. But I just wanted to maybe open up by asking Either of those two themes, how have the gospel and intimacy with God impacted your life? Well, when you say these two things, it makes my heart leap. 
<laughs> you, you know, because it is the gospel that reveals this man, Jesus Christ. And that revelation of him is his glory. So if I was to put the two together, I would say, I don't know what Jesus is really like until I see his character and attributes manifested in the gospel. And that revelation of his attributes and his character and his nature and his goodness, that is the glory. <laughs> and so Amen. these two wow. things, the gospel of glory, it's actually, uh, there's a phrase in the scripture, the gospel of glory, or the glorious gospel, praise, mm. because they're merged together because all it really is, is this man realized, this glorious wow. being actually perceived rightly that's glory and that changes man forever i mean remember when moses he asked god show me your glory and then the lord what does he do he speaks his name to him he tells him his nature and then he says it's his goodness so we have right there in what god reveals to moses is the merge of these three things they are all the same thing the name mm -hmm. of the lord the goodness of the Lord, the nature of the Lord, the character of the Lord, they are all the manifestation of what and who he is. And the response that Moses has is just like you and just like me. We <laughs> fell on our faces. <laughs> we fell down and we said, holy is the Lord. There is nobody like you. So wow. these two themes, gospel and glory, merge together in this beautiful revelation of this man that has captivated your heart and my heart and has caused us to literally, literally gladly bow our knees. It, he's almost, it seems like he's melted away our ability to resist him. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah. it's, it's changed everything. It's changed the way you, you and I think. It's changed yeah. the decisions that we make, the purpose of our life, what our days, look like what thrills us what we don't like anymore it has changed everything this man christ jesus revealed in these two things the god the glorious gospel the gospel and the glory of wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow what would you say there was a time or an event or a trial or an experience with god what sort of set you on that track of you know pursuing the gospel in that way. So I was um, born again at, in 1992. I made a decision at a youth camp to follow the Lord. Dr. Mark Rutland preached. And that's when I think I was saved. Like I was born again, became a new creation then. But in 1995, God poured out his spirit in Pensacola, Florida. Yeah. And 4 million people came through the doors in four years without one advertisement, no Facebook, none of this, not even, it's not even like a uh, real iPhones or, or smartphones yet. So all this to yeah. say, when I was, when I was born again, it was, a, a, it was religion. It was a relationship in a way with the Lord. But when I met God at Brownsville by the manifest presence of God through Steve Hill preaching the gospel and the mm. visitation that was there, that's when things really started popping up. That's when my coloring book got color. You know, I, I guess I could say in 1992, I got my parameters and I didn't yeah. really, couldn't really tell what was there. You ever open up a coloring book and you're looking at it, you're like, I think that's Mickey, but I'm not <laughs> sure what he's standing on. But once you put the colors in, maybe it's paint by number or something. Once you get the colors yeah. in, you're like, he, it's, it's Mickey. He's on a pirate ship. Donald Duck's over there. He's holding, uh, you know, you get all the vibrant clarity. That's what happened in Brownsville. Yeah. God threw the paintbrush on my life. And uh, that's when it all really started to pop off. My desire to be alone with him took over my life. I became addicted to the way it feels when I give God all my attention, whether it be in the yeah. word, whether it be prayer, whether it be worship and praise, it became the, uh, the center and source of everything in my life. So I would say the main thing was the Brownsville revival. Wow. Yeah. You know, um, I, I so I, I would say I was like saved and on fire for God and even preaching for probably about four or five years before I would say that I had any revelation of going deep in the gospel. It was like I missed it. I mean, you've got to know, you've got to say yes to Jesus. But it was like I think I had sort of the misunderstanding that 
that was sort of the elementary thing that you move on from. And it wasn't until, um, you know, just a, it was after a season of ministry where uh, things didn't go the way that I thought. And my wife and I were both in this sort of wilderness, like, God, what did you just do to us? Everything, you know, happened exactly opposite the way that we thought. And it was a setup from the Lord to just go back to the basics and begin to go deep. And during that time, I would sit in the most dry Baptist church services. I love Baptists. I was raised Baptist, but uh, we were going to church with a particular family uh, during that time. And those 200-year-old hymns, I would just (laughs) sit and weep in the pew, <laughs> you know, the theology of the cross and these hymns would just, and it, it rocked my life. Like it has mm-hmm. changed my life dramatically. So have you noticed that, that maybe some people um, miss the significance of the most foundational reality <laughs> in our entire Christian walk? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I see it to be a major problem in the midst of charismatic circles. Yeah, It seems like and I've, I'm guilty myself at different times in the past where I was like, okay, I know that already. Yeah. I, I, what else is there? And really what that is is a deep corruption because it's making light of the heaviest thing in life, that God wow. became a man. And if when we get bored with the gospel, we start making up stuff. You know, to get interested in maybe, you know, there's all kinds of weird stuff going on right now. Like, you know, like you never die or like, you know, everybody's saved. You know, you try to get into these different things to try to stimulate yourself because the reality is your heart has grown numb or people's hearts have grown numb to the gospel. The name of Jesus has become tasteless on the tongue. Wow. And so I found that this is something that the Holy Spirit causes to uh, come alive again and again. Like you said, Mm. the gospel is not like the power of God. It's not the way to the power of God. It is the power (laughs) of God because in it we have seen righteousness revealed. The the character of God has been revealed to us and that mesmerizes and is inexhaustible. I just finished about a couple months ago, the life of Jonathan Edwards, you know, the leader of the great awakening. Yeah. Uh, His life was amazing. But one thing he said in there, it's by Ian Murray. Okay. Um, it's a. It's just a biography, basic sketch yeah. of his life. But one statement for me kind of shook me the most. He said, now he wrote this book called Religious Affections. And the reason yeah. why he wrote the book is because there was so many manifestations happening in the outbreak of God that he was trying to distinguish between what is emotionalism or what he would call superstition and what is genuine work of the spirit, you know? Because mm-hmm. in some ways it was like they were indistinguishable. Now, his conclusion shook me. And it doesn't sound like much, but the more I thought upon it, the more it settled my soul. He said this, that the way you can tell the work of the spirit in a man's life is the attributes of God manifested in Jesus Christ become delightful objects of contemplation. Wow. Now, I'm going to say one more time because for the, for the viewers, it is, it is the attributes of God, but what God's mm-hmm. like manifested in the man Christ Jesus. Those things become delightful objects of contemplation. Wow. You enjoy to think upon what you've seen of God revealed most explicitly and purely in Jesus Christ, God becoming a man, living a life I could not live, dying a death I deserve, rising to take me out of death, ascending on high to the right hand of the throne of God, and then sending his spirit into the hearts of men to make them his own sons. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. You know, I used to uh, teach a few classes kind of loosely based on... um, Tozer's uh, Knowledge of the Holy, oh, where he sort powerful. of walks through those. Yeah. And this was in a, um, a you know, an awesome uh, Bible school, ministry school, the most hungry young people from around the country, you know, coming to, to be here. And again, many would consider the attributes of God to be basic or foundational, but that class was usually the favorite of the students. And it was usually the one where 
Holy Spirit would interrupt yeah. the class where people would begin weeping. Uh, I have a lot of stories of people saying, you know, just getting getting a vision for pursuing the attributes of God really impacted their life or really changed their life in some major way. So that that is awesome. And it's another one of those things you can forget. Like I used to give my interns an assignment, pick omnipresence, omniscience, or omnipotence, study it for a month, and then you're going to preach a message on it. And I would tell them, <laughs> get it burning in you, and then you'll be able to light a fire in somebody else. And again, oh. it was one of their favorite assignments, you know, those those things that we think we know. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm with you 100%. And they cause worship. Yes. You know, yes. When I, like this morning I, I came in here and I sat in my chair and the first thing I did was just start calling to mind what the Bible actually tells me about God. Simple things. <laughs> like yes. he put the, he knows the stars, those heavenly flames, he counts their numbers, knows their names. He made all yeah. the earth and the sea and all that is in it. And, I, and then thinking of things like he can cause men to vanish by breathing upon them, as the scripture says in, in Isaiah. Or, or you look at, he's the maker of the storm clouds, or he makes lightning for the rain. Or, you mm. know, the, just starting thinking of, starting to think about this vastness of God and then bringing it down to, and that being came into the restrictions and frailties of a human body wow. in order that he might reveal to me what he's like. And then he takes my and i'm just thinking through these things and it's making yeah. me get to the point where as faith rises i begin to say oh lord i worship you thank you thank you lord yeah. it, it becomes real and genuine because it's founded in like you said the gospel <laughs> yes yes wow yes i i i don't just understand what you're saying like my spirit is familiar <laughs> with what you're saying <laughs> I, uh, one of the things that I have said is, you know, the incommunicable attributes of God, the things that we can't fully relate to, those are meant to blow our mind. <laughs> <laughs> and the communicable attributes of God, the things we can relate to, are meant to light our heart on fire. <laughs> yes. Man, I'm so weird. There's a pastor I go visit pretty frequently in Tallahassee, not Tallahassee, but Tallahassee, uh, Tallahassee okay. Alabama. And he says, a God that I can completely understand is not worthy of worship. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Wow. Wow, man. <laughs> This is really good. This is so rich. I, I have a, a question, uh, kind of a callback to something that you mentioned in your first answer. You talked about becoming addicted to the presence of God. Mm -hmm. So I have a very loaded question for you. Uh, what does the secret place mean to you? First, the secret place is kind of a play on words, in my opinion, because David says you... You hide me in the secret place of your presence from the conspiracies of men. So he's showing us that the secret place of his presence is, or the secret place is his presence. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I think we think the secret place is, I don't know, you wouldn't say this, but a lot of younger Christians would say, what is my secret place? Like my closet, my car? It's not necessarily a place as much as it is a state of being mm -hmm. where you can enter, if you will, if you want to use the language of proximity and coming in and going out, um, you can enter the secret place anywhere by awareness of God's presence. I just mm -hmm. put out a, a video this morning, a short, that says the, the, basically the secret to experiencing God every day is very simple. It is the recognition that you can't do anything and that Jesus Christ has done everything and then wow. just resting in the fact of God's presence. Hannah Whithall Smith in her Christian classic, Christian Secret of a Happy Life, she said, I find that people are trying to enter God's presence, but when I read the Bible, I find you can't get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in essence, it's almost like the presence is really a recognition of God. And anywhere that a man's heart recognizes God, he can be inside, if you will, to use that language, the secret place of his presence under the shadow 
of mm. the Most High, you know? And it's funny that that verse in Psalm 91 where it says, He who dwells in the secret place, the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of Almighty. The word for Almighty there is El Shaddai, that his name meaning the all satis the all satisfying or all sufficient yeah. one. And so it's almost like when we realize him or in his shadow, in his presence, we realize him to be everything we've ever needed. Yeah. But you want to know something else that's very interesting? When God changes Abra Abraham's name to Abraham and Jacob's name to Israel, he speaks to them and tells them that he's El Shaddai. So, so it's wow. interesting that once man realizes all they need is in God, their name changes. They, they're mm. changed forever. Wow. So what wow. is the secret place? To me, it is the recognition of the truths of the gospel in experience. In experience. It's, it's experiencing the truths of the gospel through believing them in the moment. That's the secret place. Because mm. I am now the house of of the Lord. The Spirit of God dwells in us, and we wow. can drink of that river that lives on the inside of us anytime, any place, anywhere. The river of His delights is constantly flowing and it never moves. Come on. That is awesome. Wow. Yeah, I've heard you mention a number of times, um, you know, we don't, we don't enter the presence of God. We're not like trying to get God to come, you know, which I, we have a lot of language like that yeah. in the church, right? You know, it's all about like, we're trying to get there. We're trying to get him here. And um, it's been really, uh, it's been really helpful for me to kind of have that mindset, which largely it's been reemphasized by you over and over again. Uh, even uh, Madame Jean Guillon, who I know you've <laughs> uh, talked about quite a bit as well. She talks about um, bringing our faith and our courage into the presence of God. There's an element of coming with faith into yeah. the presence of God. I know that I am in your throne room. I, I believe that I'm welcomed here. And um, yeah, so maybe talk a little bit about that reality of, you know, maybe recognizing the presence of God or uh, you know, just breaking off that mindset of trying to get him to come or trying to do something to get in his presence. How do we kind of just be in his presence? Man, I, I love this question. I think that we as readers of the Old Testament, it is so cool to us to see God dwelling in the midst of man and these special relationships we see that these prophets have with God. I mean, uh, even Samuel starts speaking in a cloud, a storm cloud comes down or you have a, <laughs> he, like Moses goes into the cloud. You have Elijah calling fire down. From, you have all these really cool, almost movie-like yeah. themes and, and experiences in the Old Testament. And we as, as humans are attracted to those kinds of things. And I think sometimes because of that, we try to drag that really cool story-like um, reality from the Old Testament into the New Covenant. But wow. th there, it's not. It's changed because mm. God brought that which was external, internal. Mm. The Spirit is now on the inside. And so a lot of times in an attempt to explain New Covenant things, I think we make not a mistake, but we do an injustice in a way when we try to point to Old Testament things. Um, now, obviously, some of it can be brought over. Just look at the book of Hebrews, sure. right? But to to forget that he lives on the inside and he's been granted to us by Christ's merit mm. and then bring that into the Old Testament. Like here's an, an example. Some people think like you have to be perfect in order or completely clean in order to enter into God's presence. But the truth of the matter is, I don't know if I've ever been completely clean in my own mind. <laughs> you know sure, what I'm saying? Sure. But the whole point of the Old Testament is that Jesus, a perfectly clean, spotless lamb, would be the access point. So I'm not saying we live in sin and try to fellowship with God. I'm right. saying if we, when we really understand ourselves and our corruptions, we realize I'll never be good enough to deserve time or, or, or communion with God. But Jesus mm, is perfect. Wow. Jesus is perfect. And I, <laughs> I access God only on the basis of Christ. That's new covenant reality. And I think also yeah. a lot of people don't spend time with the Lord because they think their corruptions, their, their uh, failures, their weaknesses are hindrances to experiencing God. 
But I, I want to take that picture and tear it in half. Yeah. I think Jesus does that. For instance, Dane Ortland in his book, Gentle and Lowly, he says, the things about you that make you cringe most make him hug you tightest. Wow. <laughs> he's, he's drawn to your weakness. You know, by virtue of the fact that he is a savior, our weaknesses attract him to us. You know, like uh, he doesn't hold his nose to be able to come close to us. He's drawn to help us out of what we're in. And so corruptions recognized, weakness recognized are qualifications to come to the physician. <laughs> so th that person who says, man, I've failed, I keep failing. How can I go spend time with God? I would say to them, look at Jesus in the new covenant and see that it is because of those weaknesses, because of those failures, that he is, he is beckoning you to mm. come to him so that he might heal you, so that he might wow. be the one who, who's life to you. As what's Madame Guyon say, she says, uh, she says, be not ashamed of your, of your warts. She says, expose them to his view and they shall be healed. Wow. So I think that's very important. Um, in somebody coming to the Lord to realize even in the time of failure, we do the same thing as we do in the time of victory. We come to Jesus. Wow. In the time yeah. of victory, we do the same thing we do in the time of failure. We come to Jesus. <laughs> so I think that wow. really helps. Yeah, that is a really simple but profound way to think about it. Like we come to God with a new covenant mindset. And I totally, uh, yeah, like whenever we see the glory being poured out at the dedication of the temple, like we have that picture that's not totally accurate for where we are now, where we are the temple of God and he lives inside of us. That is, yeah. that is really powerful. That is really awesome. Wow. <clears throat> so uh, I know we have a, a, a few minutes left here um, along the lines of. Uh, the things that keep us from coming to God, because I, I agree a thousand percent with what you said. We've actually been doing a like 12 weeks on, I've called it the theology of mystical prayer. I know that word mystical can freak wow. people out, but I that's basically- a, That's a cool class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I basically, we spent the first month just talking about the priesthood of Jesus, you know, Hebrews 8 and 9, mm -hmm. you know, the whole 8, 9, and 10, and uh, just the mystery of the gospel is how we approach prayer. That's kind of been the foundation of the whole oh, deal. Uh, so anyway, I just really bear witness with what you're saying, but do you ever personally uh, have seasons where, you know, it's just, it's harder to pray or it's harder to connect with God, or maybe you're... You know, you're just struggling in the place of intimacy with God, uh, you know, and, and if not, then, you know, like what is, how do you, how do you navigate that just as seasons change and life is hard or life is easy? And, you know, do, do you experience that or what, what advice would you have uh, for those who do? So I think the, the question you have can kind of be broken up into major, three major categories. One, life situation. Um, in this one, we've all experienced like you, sometimes you have more time in a season than you have in another season. I think that's True. the first one. The second one would be like demonic oppression. Something mm. is coming against you in resistance. And then the third one would be just flesh. Okay. So mm. I'll talk, I'll talk on all three of them on the yeah. first one I've in Brownsville, bro. All we did was pray. <laughs> and we went to we went to class. We came back. We prayed. That's all we did. We had so much time. I mean, our uh, we were never outside. Our teeth broke. Our skin was pale. We were skinny as bones, because all we did was was pray. We prayed as much as we could. We ate as little as we could. We were dying slowly, really. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was a time and a season where it was wonderful. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't trade it for the for the world. But then I got married, a full time job, kids, and the time that I had was a lot smaller. And yes. so sometimes we can get discouraged in that and think that for some reason, our nearness to God is affected by that. And I mm -hmm. think that also is an insufficient understanding of the gospel. I once mm -hmm. asked Bunky, I said, sir, how much do you pray a day? <laughs> and he turns to me and he says, I do not pray to get close to God. I pray because I am close to God. <laughs> it changed my whole mentality. 
because in my younger years, I was praying to try to gain yeah. proximity to the Lord, to get closer. But Bunky was saying, don't pray to get close, pray from being inside. You know, my relationship with God should be foundational union. I am mm. one with him. I'm not trying to become one with him. I am one with him and I pray from that full acceptance place. So that kind of changes the dynamic there because if you're thinking, if we're thinking, if a man is thinking, the amount of time that I have with God is going to affect my nearness to God or how much I, I know the Lord, then your season will dictate your confidence in the Lord wow, and your relationship with so the Lord. so good. But but that's it's the gospel that dictates that, not not us. And then there's been let me do flesh first because this one is so common. The yeah. flesh is <laughs> slothful. He's he has other desires. The mm -hmm. scripture tells us directly that he cannot obey God. He does yeah. not delight in God. And we all have this. And we all feel it. And depending on whether or not we will yield to the spirit, the strength of the flesh will be. So in in some ways, a person would say. You know, I'm having a hard time being with the Lord. And the, the truth of the matter is they are giving more place to the lusts of the flesh than they are to the spirit. Therefore, it's very, it's like treading water wow. because they're, they're, they're feeding themselves other things. What would that look like? If, if a man is giving more time, I'm not saying you shouldn't watch movies. I'm not, I'm not that kind of guy. I'm not saying sure. you shouldn't play golf. Or, I'm not saying any of that stuff. But if we have more interest and give more of ourselves and our hearts and our time and our energy and our effort to those things, rather than to spending time with the Lord, the flesh is going to get very strong mm. and the spirit desires will be very weak. And it would be almost impossible to run into the prayer closet and jump into the lap of the Father and lay your head on his chest and say, there's nothing else I'd rather do. Yeah. So wow. there's, the, there's the flesh aspect of it too. So if that gets strong based on how we're living our lives and what we're giving our hearts attention to, it will become very difficult to pray. And then the last one uh, is I've just recently experienced in the last few years more than ever in my life, a mm. demonic, full-blown demonic pressure where there is almost like, remember when, I don't know if you saw Spider-Man, the one with Jake Gyllenhaal is in it, and Jake Gyllenhaal is Mysterio, he's a, uh, he's a villain, and he's able to create realities, mm. and, and Spider-Man can't tell what's real. Mm. Um, that's very similar to the demonic oppression that came over my mind for about 11 months. I wow. fought with it hardcore. The, the voice of the enemy was so loud and so real that... It was almost as if I was believing things that weren't real. And mm. I had to, I, thank God for my wife, but I had to go deeper into the cave of the Lord. Mm. I had to, I had to, I was abiding, but with this pressure, it made me have to abide and cling even more. And I believe that's the reason why the Lord allowed it is to mm. increase my grip upon wow. him because I was holding on to the Lord, but maybe I was a little loose in some areas. Mm -hmm. And with this yeah. pressure, it made me grab a hold of the Lord. So, but in those times when there's major pressure like that, you have a choice. And the choice that you have is, am I going to cling harder or am I just going to give up? And wow. I think a, a lot of people just say, I'm just going to give up. I can't take this. And so because of that, their desire for spending time with God wanes and it, they just go so long without spending time with the Lord. And, uh, wow. and they build up a case in their own minds against themselves. But I think the remedy to all three of them real quickly is the gospel. If I believe the gospel, then in that gospel, I realize my season does not dictate my, my experience of the Lord. If I believe the gospel and I set my mind on the gospel, it will deliver me from self-consciousness. <laughs> wow. Yeah. The gospel yeah. delivers me from self and which will destroy the powers of the flesh and bring me into worship. And if I believe the gospel, then I realize in the time of pressure, the Lord spreads a table for me. If I believe mm. the gospel, it means when the pressure of the enemy comes, I can, because of the gospel, hold on to him who's on the inside of me and I can get through whatever demonic oppression, oppression it is. So I would say, yeah. like you're saying, it's gospel. <laughs> it's gospel. <laughs> it's the means by which we see Jesus. And in seeing Jesus, we fall in love again and again and again. And this keeps our relationship consistent. And I mean, yes. when I say relationship, I don't just mean like checking off the religious duties. I'm talking about what you're saying, which is experiential exchange with mm -hmm. God. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. 
That is so powerful. That is so good. Um, I was thinking of, and I, and I, I we're, we'll close with this, but I was thinking of while you were talking about the last thing, the demonic oppression, I remember we met with, my wife and I met with a woman who um, had just been involved in a lot of darkness and she was seeking deliverance, but she had been to a lot of deliverance ministries uh, and she was almost like an expert in deliverance. And I've met people like that before. You know what I mean? They just, so anyway, but the Lord spoke to me to give her a copy. At like, I felt like a deliverance session is not your answer right now. And so um, the Lord spoke to me to give her a copy of this little book by John Piper. Uh, I think there's, I think whenever the passion of Christ came out, it was just called the passion of Christ. And then the other version, it's like uh, 50 Reasons Jesus Died or something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just, I have that book. Yes, yes. It's just one after another, doctrines of salvation, just the gospel, you know, in little <laughs> bite-sized chunks. And since that time, I have probably given a dozen of those books away specifically to people who are just dealing with a lot of demonic oppression and just yes. they feel like they're not finding their solution in, you know, deliverance <laughs> sessions. It's like, man... Right. Here's what you need. Read about Jesus. You know? Yeah, the gospel <laughs> is the power of God unto salvation. Yes. All kinds of salvation. <laughs> the mind, of the heart, everything. <laughs> yes, amen, amen. Praise God. Wow, th this has been so unbelievably rich. It's been powerful and inspirational. And um, as I said, the last couple of years, you know, your teaching – uh, has been a major inspiration to me. Your beard as well, major inspiration. <laughs> Yours to me. is great. Love I love it. <laughs> uh, but could you maybe pray for us? Just any who are watching. I know my heart is leaping saying, yes, God, I, I want to yes. live in this reality. Maybe just pray for anyone watching who's just hungry. Absolutely. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for every viewer, myself included. I pray, Lord, that our love for you would increase more and more in the knowledge of you and the experience of you so that we can discover what is really you for in seeing what you are really like we become single-minded and it would change the way we live and the change the way we act and think and treat other people and lord i thank you for the righteousness imputed through Jesus Christ. And Lord, I'm asking that each one of us would grow in the bearing forth of the fruit of the righteousness that is in Jesus Christ, so that God will gain all glory from our lives. So Lord, that's my prayer. Increase our love in this way, knowledge and experience. In your precious name, we long for this love increase in us. Light and heat, light, illumination, sight, and heat, warmth, feeling. Lord, marry these two things together in our love for you, in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, just like I told you, what a powerful conversation. And uh, I do, again, want to mention, you really want to go to Eric's YouTube channel. He has hundreds of videos. We barely scratched the surface of some things in our conversation today, but as you can see, he is a very deep well and really a very kind of heart healthy, you know, person that you want to listen to in order to really strengthen your walk with God, give you a really great perspective on the Lord and on yourself. I also want to encourage you to check the links that I'm including. You can see his books there. You can see his ministry. And, uh, you know, if you want to give, I'm sure on his website, you can go and give a donation just to say thank you uh, to him. And I do want to mention as well, as usual, that we have a email list, Supernatural Theology. If you want to know about our podcast that my wife and I do, uh, our Deep Waters Worship and Prayer that we do once a month, or, of course, the Supernatural Theology show that we do every Wednesday night, as well as some live events that are coming up. 
uh, go ahead and send me an email at supernaturaltheology at gmail.com and I'll be sure to add you to the list so that you can stay in touch. Please consider sharing the video. You know, if you are on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel. If you're on Facebook, Instagram, share the video to get it out in front of more people. Thank you so much for joining everybody. I'll see you next Wednesday.